Welcome to Bethel Baptist Church. Please find a seat nearby and take your songbook and we can turn to number nine. We will sing, Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore Him. Let's stand together as we sing, as we worship the Lord together. Father, we thank you for today, Lord, and we just ask your blessing on the service today, Lord. We pray for those that are traveling today and those that are still maybe on their way to church, Lord, that you would be with them and keep them safe, Lord, in this weather. And Lord, we just thank you that uh, no matter what the situation is outside, Lord, that we always have you. And Lord, even if we have to meet in our homes or meet over the telephone or however we meet, Lord, that we know that two or more are gathered in your name, that you're with us also. So we thank you for that. And Lord, we just ask your blessing on all that's done here today. And Lord, we think of those who are out sick. And Lord, that we pray for on Wednesday evenings, that you would just have a special blessing on them. And Lord, we just pray that everything that's done here would bring glory and honor to you. And just pray you be with the pastor, Lord, as he brings your word to us. And we ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. We're reading from John chapter 16. John 16, verses 1 through 15. These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogue. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. But now I go my way to, to him that sent me. And none of you asketh me, whither it goest thou. But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of the world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when the Spirit of truth is come, he will guide you unto all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. 
He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. As many of you well know, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is quite misrepresented in the world today. And it has, it, it's no surprise then that His act on the cross is significantly misunderstood as well. Those who would acknowledge the reality of Jesus' existence are still confused and in the dark about His death and its significance. They don't realize that His death was more than just an innocent good man dying on false charges. The spiritual implications, the eternal implications of the cross go unrealized in our world today. That is what our Song of the Month in verses 3 or 4 are bringing to, re, uh, bringing to light. They read this, My Jesus kind was torn by nails, by, by nails of cruel men. And to his cross, as grace prevailed, God pinned my wretched sin. My Jesus pure was crushed by God, by God in judgment just. The Father grieved, yet turned His rod on Christ, made sin for us. Let's stand together as we continue to learn My Jesus Fair together. turn to the next song, um, Complete in Thee. We're a little more familiar with that, I believe. And if we, get the, if we get the PowerPoint back up, then we'll sing My Jesus Fair. Just died back there. Is what happened? 
So we've got a laptop back there we're plugging in and you know when it when it when it, <clears throat> when it rains it snows. That's all I can say. Uh, and the snow is we can blame that. I won't mention his name, but his um, his uh, initials are Eric Reversky. He, he has a real problem with uh, praying for snow. We would be in, in a blizz, a constant blizzard all the time if it weren't for his wife praying against snow. So it's a really good thing that um, they're married. Anyway, all right. So um, good to have everybody out today. If you would uh, make sure that you read your bulletins and read your emails. I know I send a lot out, but you know why I send so many emails out? Because communication is a really good thing, and also because I don't like to have long announcements on Sunday mornings because it interrupts, it sort of interrupts the flow. So that's why we do so many emails and sign-up sheets and all kinds of things like that to try to make sure that we're all communicating and stay on the same page. So please check out those things, check the bulletin board, check the bulletin, the bulletin and check the... Make sure you're reading your emails. Are we good yet? I'm stalling. We good? Okay. All right. Very good. Gentlemen, if you would come forward for our offering at this time. <clears throat> and uh, this always just, you know, we're a family, right? We, we uh, make it fun sometimes. Like this. All right. Let's pray together. Father, we do come to you and thank you for who you are, and we thank you, Lord, that we can, you can teach us lessons, even through the interruptions of life, whether it be the weather that we have no control over, and even the technology that it seems we have no control over. Um, I uh, thank you, Lord, that through these things, we can learn um, to have our minds stayed on you amidst the distractions. In fact, it really teaches us to do that. And we admit before you that because of our fallen world, we are always embarded on every side by distractions. And yet, it is of your desire for us to stay focused on you and to be able to worship you in a less than per perfect atmosphere, in a less than perfect world. And we thank you, Lord, uh, that it is because of your grace that we are able to do that and um, that you have given us everything we need. You have, you have saved us. You've indwelt us with your spirit. You have made us and declared us righteous before, before um, yourself through Christ. And Christ intercedes on behalf of us, and the Spirit of God intercedes on behalf of us. There are so many blessings that we have that make it possible for us, despite a fallen world, to live a life that is pleasing to you. And I pray that you would help us to remember that, that you have in your wisdom, your awesome wisdom and, and incredible power, have made it possible for us to be able to live a life that is pleasing in your sight. And you have really compensated for all of the, of the problems of the fall. And we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for the offering that will be taken today. We ask, Lord, that you would use it for your honor and glory. Help us to give in a way that's pleasing to you. And we think of perhaps people that aren't with us because of the weather or other, other factors. Lord, pray that you'd keep them safe and bring, us, uh, bring them back to us soon. And we pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen.
before the message tonight, uh, this morning, we'll sing My Jesus Fair, and then we'll go to our last song before then. Uh, number two in your song, Become Thou Fount of Every Blessing. So, let's stand together for My Jesus Fair. At this time, children are dismissed to junior church as well.
Bibles, please, and turn to Ephesians chapter 4 this morning. Ephesians chapter 4. This morning, what I'd like to do, just by way of introduction, is just read this passage. And what I believe you're going to find is that it needs no introduction. And the reason I say that, it's not because I didn't prepare for the message this week. It w- it's just, the reason I say that is that this is so applicable there, this just has direct application for us that should immediately we'll recognize if we'll just read this passage. So I'd like to go ahead and do that this morning. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 32. Uh, picking up here in verse 25. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let's pray together. Father, as we look at this incredibly applicable text, we pray that you would help us to see just exactly what a new man, what putting on a new man looks like, and just exactly how important for us it is. And what can happen and probably will happen if we neglect to do so. We know that despite whether or not we do, you love us if you, if you've, I mean, you you love all people, but you love us even with a special love if we know you as our Savior. And that love does not change based on our behavior. And your faithfulness does not change based on our behavior. But there are things that do that are affected. The greatest of which is that we grieve you. And we grieve your spirit. And I pray, Lord, today as we look at your word, particularly at these, at these direct commands that every one of us struggle with, I pray that you would help us to see just how important it is to put these things on and to put off the things that we're supposed to for the sake of the kingdom and for the sake of what you are doing in your church and for the sake of the pleasure of yourself and your spirit. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4. I want you to to see, to gain the real weight of this passage, I want you to see the um, beginning in chapter 4, verse 1, I want you to really see the, the, um, the flow of thought here. You'll recall from chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, that Christ, or that Paul says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. And he is speaking here in the plural. He is saying you, you corporately need to walk worthy. But there are clearly individual applications of this with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering for bearing one another there you go there's you have singular applications of this and why because there is one body and one spirit even as you're called and one hope of your calling you see there folks in the beginning here that God desires for us to walk worthy so that we can be the body that God wants us to be and then we see in verses 7 all the way through 16 But the emphasis is almost entirely on how the corporate setting is supposed to work in a local church. Um, There are some implications for the universal church, but it's primarily local church based here in verses 7 through 16, just by by reason of of the functions that we find in the passage. A lot about giftedness and individual parts working together. For instance, we see in verse 16, which is the conclusion of this part, this portion, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working and the measure of every part maketh increase of what? 
You all following me to <laughs> this morning? He's a little bit, a little tired. Everybody got to sleep in this Sunday school. Make an increase of the of the body under the edifying of itself in love. And then what we find here in Ephesians chapter four verses seventeen through twenty four is it reverts back to an emphasis on the individual that you and I need to put off and put on. And it is something clearly that we discussed that is something that only we can do as individuals. There's very little um, that, that anybody else can do for us in these areas other than, I mean, I help us identify what we need to put off and put on. And, and the renewing of the, of, the, of the spirit of the mind happens through the spirit of God. He does that. But the responsibility in verses 17 through 24 is primarily an individual responsibility. But then what we have in verses 25 through 30 is, is like a combination of the two. You have, just by way of the structure, I want you to see this. You have, first of all, the structure, number one, is you have a behavior to put off. Do you see that? For example, it says, wherefore, putting away lying. That's something you're supposed to put off. The next one, anger, is actually inverted. It says, put on anger, but don't sin. And then we have, don't steal, but work. And then we have, don't have corrupt communication. Instead, have edifying communication. You have there two components, one of putting off in each case, and one of putting on. And then, though, folks, this is important to, to note it, notice, then you have a corporate consideration. This is something that perhaps you haven't seen before. Maybe you have, but perhaps you haven't. That in each of these cases, there is a, an effect if you don't do this, or in some cases, if you do do this, there is an effect that it has on the body. Would you notice, for example, here in verse 25, wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are what? We are members one of another. Why should we put away lying and why should we speak truth with our neighbor? It is because we are members one of another. And then you see, be angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your back, wrath, neither give place to the devil. And although some, many people would probably think that that is a, a individual consideration, I believe that that is actually a corporate consideration primarily. That if you do not handle your anger correctly, it will affect the body and it will give place to the devil. We're going to look at that in a few minutes. Then you have another consideration, but uh, it, it says, uh, "Let him labor. Don't steal. Let him labor. Why? Because then, if you're laboring, you'll have to give to them that needeth." Another corporate idea here. Another corporate consideration that if you will not steal and you will work with your hands, that it will benefit the body, the body of Christ, the church. And then what we have again here is, "Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth." But that which is good to the use of edifying, why? That it might do what? It might minister grace unto the hearers. Now, folks, at this point, I just want to pause and make a couple of very initial applications here, and then we're going to go into the details of this. Does God's love for you change? If you know Christ as your Savior and you are a genuine believer, does God's love for you change based on your behavior? And the answer is no. Does God's faithfulness change based upon your behavior? And the answer, folks, is no. But are there negative effects based on our behavior? And the answer clearly in this passage is yes. And the primary effect, the primary negative effect that we have, there's an ultimate negative effect that we'll look at, but the, but the, the, the negative effect that we see initially in this passage is that it will affect the body the body of Christ. That what God is doing in the world is creating for himself a kingdom. And, and our role in this right now is that he is building his body. He is building his church. And our responsibility in the body has, has effect on the body based upon what we do as individuals. The other application I would just really make here is this. Do we usually think of our sin as affecting the body? And I don't think we do. 
I think as a whole, if you look at the church, it is so fragmented. And even individual body of bodies of believers, even local churches, are, do not have the unity that God would desire. And so we, not, we do not think in terms of affecting the body. Back in the first century, they met every day. Daily they met. Do you suppose that if the believers met daily, there was an awareness of the body? I mean, I would think so, right? I mean, every single day they're meeting for prayer and, and the Lord's Supper, and they're meeting together, and they're aware that they are part of one another. That this is, it is not as though there, there's an individualistic walk with the Lord to, to the exclusion of a corporate, a corporate relationship. They realized that they were part of a, re, a greater body. They were part of, and what they did affected the body. I would just make this application. We have, and I'm very thankful for it, we have some, some um, we have a new ministry, essentially, that is uh, a television, uh, not television, it's a, um, a live streaming. That can you be used either to, to connect to the body in a greater way or to isolate yourself from the body. Do you realize that? You, if somebody cannot make it to church, it allows them to connect to the body. If they can't make it. But if somebody can make it to church and chooses to look at the television and, and chooses to look on their computer uh, instead, it will actually isolate them from the body. You realize that? I mean, there really is something we have to be careful about this, just very practically when it comes to this, this, I this issue. We want to use it, we want it only to, 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 to be used in our as far as our local members for people to connect when they can't make it out. And, and we are, people are using it that way. And praise the Lord for that. That's a blessing. But we ought never use it. I'll just be honest with you. We ought never use it to isolate ourselves from the body. And by the way, I'm going to make one more application that I, I just want to make here. I, I, would, I did not want to even cancel Sunday school. I really did not want to do that. And the reason I didn't want to do that is because I don't want for any reason for somebody to think that it is not important Meeting together as a body of believers is incredibly important. Do you realize that even if you learn nothing, if you don't learn a single thing, you are still, it is still important to meet together. And I want to encourage particularly nursery, nursery workers this way. There are some people that probably feel like they're in the nursery constantly or working with junior church constantly. And I just want to say at the very outset, you ought to... You ought to, I know you sometimes are weary at this, be not weary in well-doing, be faithful, but realize that even if you're working in the nursery, your coming is important because it, it reminds you that you are part of a body. You ever thought of it that way? And to neglect coming because you feel as though you won't be able to learn or something of that nature, folks, um, you're still part of the body. It reminds us, being together reminds us that we are part of the body. And we don't, meet as, we don't meet as often as we ought to. Sunday morning and Sunday school and Sunday night and Wednesday night are not enough. And other activities that we're doing is not enough. Because we're not still at the first century standard, are we? If we really wanted to do church as God desired to do church, uh, we would be meeting every single day. Now, is that, is that culturally possible? Probably not. And um, I'm not suggesting it. I'm just trying to bend the envelope a little bit here, <laughs> the other direction, um, some, so that we sort of hit straight here when it comes to these kinds of things. Meeting together and being vitally linked to the body is important. It's important for our personal spiritual growth and purity. <clears throat> I don't know... I don't think it's very common for us in our church culture to connect personal purity with corporate interaction. But God says the more vitally we link to, link to the body, and we have examples of this in Scripture, the more we are going to feel as though we are accountable to the body. Now, that's my hobby horse. Um, I, by the way, am not suggesting that if you miss a service, you're sinning. I, I don't, get that, don't get that at all. That's not what I'm saying at all. Um, or that if you don't, I'm just saying, folks, that we've got to make sure that we are connected to each other. Really. I mean, that's really what I'm saying here. And it's going to be important for us to see this through the entire message that we are connected one to another. 
And the more we realize this, it takes effort on all of our parts, the, the, more, it, the more we will be able to fulfill what God, God really desires for us as a body of believers. In verse 25 here then we pick up, and we find here the first, uh, the first um, behavior of what we are to put off and put on. Verse 25 says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we, why? Because we are members one of another. This is natural for us, for Paul to say this, because if you recall from last week, the previous verse tells us that our new man is made after righteousness and holiness and truth. And so he now, and we actually have a conjunction that demonstrates this, the connection to the previous verse, he is now saying that if you are to put on the new man, it is going to be that the outflow of that is that you are going to be a person of truth. And that you won't compromise in this area. That you will not shade the truth or lie or say something false just because it's convenient for you or I to do this. The world does that, doesn't it? Anybody that's worked and rubbed shoulders with the world for any length of time is going to realize that there are people in the world, and most people in the world, probably most, I don't know if what, the, what, the, what the percentage is, but many people will, have, will be honest to a point because they have a conscience, even if they don't know the Lord, until, it's, until the pressure is on. And if there's any pressure, they will be glad to just, just um, compromise their own sense of authenticity and genuineness and truthfulness. But I want us to think specifically here, folks, of the reality of what will happen in a church if there is lying and if there is false, uh, false information and if there is untruths. It will, folks, it will destroy a church from the inside out. One of the things that is so, un so damaging, and it does happen in churches, I'm thankful to my knowledge, we don't, I don't think we have this problem. Maybe we do, and I don't know. I guess I wouldn't know it, probably. Uh, but as far as I know, we don't have this issue. But folks, may we always say to ourselves, I would rather be truthful and it hurt me than to lie on any level. Folks, it's very important. Why? Because it says, our consideration here is that we are members one of another. It's kind of like the disease of lupus. Lupus is a disease of an overactive immune system where the immune system actually attacks, your, your, your own immune system attacks your organs. And it will eat away organs and tissue and things like that. It will, it with untre going untreated, it will eat away, you'll, you'll be eaten away from the inside out. And folks, that's exactly what will happen to church when you have falsehood and you do not have truth and you don't have an, an absolute loyalty to the truth. Do you know, folks, that you ought, we ought to be more loyal to the truth than we are to any person? We ought to be more loyal to the truth than we are to any individual person. God desires us to be people of the truth, and if we are putting on a new man, what's going to be clear about us is that we are truthful. If we are not, it will really destroy us. John Chrysostom said this, if an eye sees a serpent, does he lie to his foot? If a tongue tastes something bitter, will he lie to his stomach? And so it is that if a person, a member of the body, lies to another member of the body, it will destroy the body from the inside out. It is very serious for us that we take this. And really, what he is speaking here of, as well of is just a, a matter of general authenticity. So far by this point, you might be saying to yourself, you know what, I, I think I'm clear on this one. I'm pretty truthful. I really don't lie. I don't want to, I, I'm pretty clear on this. Folks, what he's really talking about here is authenticity and genuineness. Um, do we have churches that struggle with this? Is there hypocrisy in churches today? And every one of us would, would identify with that, that, that we have seen this, that there is not a transparency and there is not a, 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 oftentimes a, a truthfulness when it, some things, when it comes to these kinds of things. What we are on Sunday is different than what we are on Monday. And folks, I'm not suggesting here that we don't use discretion and discernment when it comes to the body, uh, but, but when it comes to this, there ought to be a sense of genuineness and authenticity in the body. 
And if we don't have that, we're members of one another, it's going to affect the body. The health of the body is at stake. Then we move here then, if someone is very strongly truthful and is an ardent, even defender of the truth and is loyal to the truth, it is possible for that to be, for Satan to use that against him. You know how? We can become angry. Now follow this. The Bible says next here, be, be angry and sin not. He says later in the passage, if you'll look down just a few, moments, a few verses later, verse 31, it says, let, not, let all bitterness and wrath and what? And anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. So which is it? He says on one hand, be angry. And on another hand, put it away from you. And what we have to conclude by this apparent contradiction, it's not a contradiction, but apparent contradiction, is that the, it is a different kind of anger that he is talking about in this verse 26. And what I would recommend here, folks, is that what he's really talking here about is righteous anger. Is there a place for righteous anger? And I would suggest to you that there is. Let me explain. Another word that we ought to make, we ought to understand as synonymous with the word anger, and many people don't realize this, is this word hatred. Do you realize that the New Testament uses the term anger and hatred synonymously? That's why it says over in Matthew chapter 6 that if you are angry with your brother, it is though you want to kill him. The New Testament makes no distinction between anger of a certain kind and hatred. But are there things, folks, that we ought to have a hatred for? We ought to hate sin. We ought to hate sin like God hates sin. We ought to hate sin when sin does something, when we commit sin. And when we see what sin does to us, there ought to be a hatred and an even anger toward our own sin. And one of the things we ought to re realize here, folks, is that before we are angry at somebody else's sin, we ought to look at ourselves and make sure we're angry at our own sin first. But certainly, even so, there is a sense in which it's, it's right to be incensed about sin and wrongdoing. I think that there is something right about being incensed that we have committed more, more murders in the last 50 years than Hitler did by way of abortion. I think it's right for us to be angry about that or at least at times to become incensed about it, folks. But listen, let me tell you, it is important for us and it's very common for us to allow those, those, those right senses of anger to easily decline into a wrong kind of anger and we sin. In fact, if you think often about the times that you have been angry, often you feel as though there is some point in which you are justified in being angry. And it is possible that you have been justified at some point. That there is some point in what you are saying that you feel angry because there is actual sin or there is actual wrongdoing or your conscience is bothering you because of something that is going on. And that kind of anger might be right, but it's not wrong before the flesh takes it and twists it. And you become angry in a wrong way and you've sinned because of an anger that was at, in, the, in, the, in its early stages was justifiable. And that's why, folks, it says in the passage that there is a catch here for us. There is a test as to whether or not our anger has, is right or wrong. What we find here in the passage, look what it says. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your what? On your wrath. Do you realize, folks, that righteous anger, the kind that is pleasing to the Lord, is always only temporary? You are not to be perennially angry. You are not to remain even righteously so. You're not, folks, to, be, to, to remain righteously angry. We're not supposed to be righteous anger and have righteous anger and then you do harm to people. That's not the, that's not the point of, 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 of biblically right anger. 
And the reason I say that, folks, so emphatically is that God says it. He says in the book of Romans, he says uh, that we ought to, that God says, I am the avenger, the avenger of, of sin. He says, he says in that passage in, Rome, in chapter 12, verse 19, he tells us that God, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. That's why you never have to stay angry ever. Do you realize that? We never have to stay angry. Because, folks, the only reason we would want to stay, stay angry is that if we think as though we can take it upon ourselves to fix the problem. And anger, sustained anger, doesn't fix the problem. In fact, even righteous anger in this passage doesn't identify that somehow it will do good to the body. Do you see that in the passage? For this, the only thing he says is, is just make sure that your anger doesn't turn wrong. Because if you do, you are going to give place to the devil. And I would just admit, I would just uh, say to you um, that I think this is talking about corporately primarily. I think it's probably accurate to say that when we sin and let the sun go down upon our wrath, it affects us internally. In fact, we know that to be true because if we looked over to Hebrews chapter 11 or chapter 12, we would find that it says, make sure that there is no root of bitterness that is in you that will spring up and defile many. Which is why I think this passage is talking about how it will affect us corporately. Folks, if you and I are angry and we stay angry, it will give place to the devil in the body of Christ. It's very serious. And unfortunately, some of us have experienced it. Some of us have seen what it will do, if not many of us, has seen what anger gone unchecked and unresolved will do to a body of believers. It will give place to the devil. And when a body comes under this kind of, of danger, it affects its members. It's like it becomes self-destructive. Why, why will you see a church on one hand be thriving and healthy and then years down the road suddenly just be a skeleton? It, folks, a lot of times it is this issue of righteous anger that's never been, been resolved. Or, I'm sorry, anger, righteous anger that's turned to just anger and never been resolved. It really it causes us to realize just how important it is, folks. If you have, an, if you have a sense of an injustice when it comes to sin, number one, make sure, according to what Christ says in Matthew 6, make sure you are taking the beam out of your own eye before you try to take the speck out of somebody else's. That is a prerequisite. If you try to reach in and take the speck out of somebody else's eye before you've taken the beam out of your own eye, folks, the Bible says you can't see clearly to do it. You will cause damage to that person's eye. I mean, you really think about it. If you can't see and you try to remove something from somebody else's eye, just practically speaking, what is going to happen? It's going, you're going to damage the person's eye in the process. Is it always um, wrong to try to help someone else? No. In fact, the Bible wants us to encourage each other and challenge each other and even correct each other. But folks, we've got to make sure that we, we take the log out of our own eye first. And then once we do, we need to make sure that, that the reason that we would have any cause to take action upon our, dis, our, our, dis, our uncomfortableness of a situation, any cause of that would be because we genuinely love. And we're going to talk about that in Ephesians chapter 5, walking in love. What we then have here is we have a, a bit of an abrupt move. The two, those two are connected. They speak the truth in love. And the and in the text here, they're connect. The other concept here of, of be angry and sin not are, are actually linked up by a conjunction. But then we have here, uh, the next one is sort of a clear, just definitive command statement. It says in verse twenty eight, "Let him that stole steal no more, 
but rather let him labor, working with his hands the things that are good. It says, first of all, we need to stop stealing. What are we going to put off? Well, we need to stop stealing. Now, for us to understand what Paul is really saying here, we need to understand, and some of you will be very, will be, um, will see the grass green on the other side here probably, and I can identify with this. Back in the first century, they had no welfare system at all. And so if somebody was at, without employment, what they, they were, there was a much stronger temptation to steal. And so you had theft as a result of being unemployed as something that happened very frequently. And in fact, all of us to some degree would see this as a little bit more understandable. Even, even in the book of Proverbs, it identifies that if somebody um, steals a loaf um, of bread because he's hungry, there is at least a different a, a appearance to it or a different look at it. But Paul says for a Christian who's putting on a new man, that's not acceptable. Do not, he says, steal. And folks, of course, you and I all know that stealing is another thing that is very, that is very true of the world. Stealing time is very common in our world. I remember working at, at um, a particular place, and I won't name the place now that this is going on live air uh, here. That's the one thing. I have to be careful of some of these things. But I was working in a particular place, and a particular person at the place um, was, um, he was, um, uh, uh, he was over me, he was a crew chief, and he wanted to punch my, he wanted to say that I did not take a lunch. And I did take lunch, I did take a lunch break. And uh, the reason he wanted to say this was because he wanted to say it about himself and he wanted to say it about his whole crew so there wouldn't be any inconsistencies. And so he was on the way back, he said, hey guys, we, we, we didn't take a lunch, right? And I said, no, <laughs> we did take a lunch. And he said, but we didn't take a lunch, right? And I said, we did take a lunch. I just was very calm. I, didn't, I, I tried my best not to show disrespect, but I just said, we did take a lunch. And he said, well, you better not throw me under the bus. And I really had to, had to decide how to handle that. <coughs> so here's how I handled it. I went inside after he, he actually wrote on my time card, no lunch, which was, he could do that. It, it was allowed for the, the crew chief to do that. So I just went over and I crossed it out and I put, I took a lunch and just left it. And, and uh, there was no way I was going to allow that uh, to, to happen. Folks, you know, it's very tempting though. I didn't want to make people mad at me. I didn't want the crew chief that I was working with at the time to suddenly um, become angry. And in fact, it, it, he did become angry and there was all kinds of uh, outcomes. Eventually he got fired is what happened. But, but anyway, um, as a result of that, he started really losing it with me. And he did not, um, <clears throat> he, he definitely let the sun go down on his wrath, to say the least. And uh, anyway, he ended up, um, uh, anyway, that's, that's kind of beyond the point. But my point is, folks, that we do need to we do need to be people that will just not steal. That even if it's minor things in our jobs, that we choose not to steal. That we don't, April 15th coming up, that we do not cheat on our income tax. That we declare everything that we, we can when it comes to income. This is important for us. Why? It's not, folks, that will suddenly, God will doom you if you don't. It is because you are demonstrating that if you don't do this, you are not putting on the new man. You are not putting off the old man. And what God says here in the passage, and what he's dealing with in, the, in this sense is, specifically it says, what we ought to be doing instead of stealing is working with our hands. That's a novel concept. That if we will work with our hands then we will be able to feed our mouths. The Bible says in Proverbs, if you don't work, neither should you eat. Now, though, I will say this, what happens if you lose your job, your employment? Do you know what God's answer to this is? That there's enough people not stealing, 
and enough people that are working in the body that they are to help the people that do lose their employment. They are able to help them to give to them that need. Do you see that in the passage? That's what it's saying. It's saying, folks, there's a result here. There's a corporate result that if everybody is working to live and somebody or a few people lose employment, it happened in the first century, it happens now, then we all are able to help that person or a few people that, that don't have employment until they get employment. And do you suppose, just I'm just going to be very practical here, do you suppose that if the body of believers is helping that person not to get employment, that there would, uh, not that helping the person doesn't have employment, wouldn't there be a greater motivation to get employment? Right? I mean, that person is not going to feel as though he can just bum off the welfare system. Okay, I'm getting a little too political here. Um, the point here is all I'm saying here, folks, is God's system is for us to work. To work for what we have. Does that mean that, there, that the Bible actually says we can't receive anything from the government? The Bible never says that. And some of us received, a, year, a couple years ago, received a stimulus. I doubt you turn that back into the IRS. It's not wrong to receive somebody, something from the government. This is, now we're all, some of us are being forced into it, frankly. But, folks, what our desire ought to be is to work for our food. There ought to be a desire to work for our, li for our living. And we ought to do that. He then finally says here, and this probably is the most, the one that really may hit us between the eyes. He says here, let no, let no, there is no qualifiers for this. He says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Let me ask you a question. I'm just curious, in this room, how many of you all have ever built with your hands anything? Would you just show me you've built something? Okay, all right, well, most of the people have built something with their hands. How many of you have built something that is that has some sort of foundation involved? Okay, now we, uh, you know, Harry is like the, you know, he could stand up and raise two hands and his feet too and everything. But, but for the rest of us, we at least are familiar with this. What we have here is a contrast. We have, don't let corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of what? <coughs> Edifying, and the word there is to build up. He's using building terms here. Paul likes building terms. In fact, we see that a lot in the New Testament. Folks, what he is saying here is that we ought not have corruption in our building through communication. Instead, we need to build up in our building. A foundation. I remember when I was up and headed up to Pennsylvania, wanted to buy a house. Um, the, we would go and look at different houses. I think we looked probably at 50 different houses up there when I was, when I was up there. There's a lot of old houses up there. And um, I got to the place. At first, I would look at all the amenities and everything, and I'd look at all, all the nice, you know, whatever they had, kitchen and bathroom and all that. And then I would eventually make my way down to the basement. And I would often find in some of these older houses serious problems, diagonal cracks in the foundation in the basement, and I said, well, we're not touching that. Now, I'm no builder, but I know if you see a diagonal crack through, through masonry, it's not a good thing. Right, Harry? I mean, that's got to be right. So, so it may not be completely irreparable, but for me, I didn't want to touch it. So, um, so it got to the place where eventually what I began to do is I'd go into the house, and I would, the, 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 the realtor would be like, see, see the nice stuff, and, they, and I'd just head straight for the basement. I mean, I didn't even look at anything else until I went, st I got so, this, I didn't even want to waste my time with anything else until I went, I, I brought a flashlight with me. The realtor, I'm walking in, I'm, I'm, I got a flashlight in my pocket, she goes, she, I don't think she had this very often. I don't think this is usually how people look at houses. But anyway, for me, I just had a flashlight in my pocket and I went straight to the basement and if there was any question about the foundation, I was not going to buy the house. Folks, when we have corrupt communication in the body, it is going to destroy the building. Well, what is corrupt communication? It's communication that doesn't build another brother or sister up. It tears down instead of building up. 
It discourages instead of encourages. Let me just ask you, Christian, in your interactions with other believers outside this local assembly and in this local assembly, is your communication edifying? Is it building somebody else up? So often it's easy for us to not think about how our communication is. And you know what's interesting about the passage? It never says, uh, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Or, option number one, just be neutral. Or, option number two, be edifying. It's as though, the way it's worded here, there's no neutrality with your words. Even, either the, even, e either you're, you are tearing down with your words, or you are building up with your words. There's only, there's only one way to find neutrality. You say nothing. <laughs> okay. But usually that's not good either because it doesn't help us connect with each other. The point here in this passage is that God wants us to, be, to build each other up, to be encouraging one another in our communication. Can I ask you a question? Can you identify a problem with someone else? Can you do that and be edifying? Sure you can. What's the key? It's how you do it. It's really how it's done. So often we can be right on what we say and wrong on how we say it. I mean, that really is something that we really ought to give due consideration to. I, I, there are people that come to me often, um, different people that will come to me and say, hey, uh, have you noticed this? Have you seen this? Have you done this? And I really, I don't mind that. Don't come to me all at one time, please. <laughs> but I really don't mind that. But you know, I really appreciate if somebody says, hey, I see this problem, can I help with it? <laughs> I mean, that's much more edifying, right? <laughs> God wants our speech to be edifying one to another, to build, to build up. Why? Because we have the opportunity to minister what? Grace to the hearers. What is grace? Grace is God's unmerited favor. That's what grace is. It's God's unmerited favor. Do you suppose that you and I need grace? I mean, we were saved, but I, you got it all figured out? No, no, folks. The more, you, the more you rub shoulders with people in the body of Christ, the more you're going to find that we are needy people. We have great needs. And... We, I, I, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and suggest to you that we can't all get it all from God directly. And what I mean by that is that God has set it up in His system, in His program, the way that He has designed it, is that you and I as people in the body of Christ need to be conduits of God's grace to each other. That you and I have the opportunity to, be, to, to demonstrate God's favor in somebody else's life. Doesn't always mean that you're going to flatter people. Or that you're going to pat them on the back. Or you're going to, um, or you're going to pacify people, folks. Sometimes it means you've got to say something that is direct and difficult for them to hear, and may cause them to have, their, have, have struggles, but you really desire to build them up. And if you choose not to, you're withholding God's grace from them. God says, we may minister, He wants us to minister grace to each other by our words. Now, those are the the four considerations here in this text. But I want you to see then that there is an ultimate, an ultimate thing or ultimate um, result that we ought to have when we're thinking of all of this. And we find that in chapter 4, verse 30. It says here, and we see the word, do you see the very first word there? What is the very first word there? It's the word and. 
It connects then, folks, it connects to the previous statements. And that's going to become, become very important for us. But first of all, I want us to understand, it says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. What is the description here of the word grieve? What does it mean? First of all, I want us to understand how it's used in Scripture. In the Old Testament, in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, we actually find that this word is used when David is in grief over his wayward son, Absalom. Some of you have, have experienced a wayward child. You're a child that has gone the wrong direction. And you know firsthand the grief that David felt when Absalom went his own way. Or perhaps you have family members or friends. Probably every one of us has family members or friends of people that perhaps know the Lord or profess to know the Lord and they have chosen to go their own, their own way and they and you are experiencing grief. It's used... Um, also, it's used in the context of mourning. Um, uh, it's used in the context in 2 Corinthians 2 4. Paul is talking about the church at Corinth. He says, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears, not that ye should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. He says to the church at Corinth, who, who really was having a lot of sin problems and we're going their own way, and we're full of pride and immorality. He says, I'm, I wrote to you with great tears of heart. And he said, not that I wanted you to be grieved, and he uses this term here, so it's sort of in the context of this. But folks, one that we can really even more identify with, this word grieved, is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, where it says, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, as others that have no hope. The word sorrow there is grieved. And if you have not experienced the, the wayward, the, the having someone close to you that has gone wayward, and you've not grieved that way, you have probably grieved of someone's close to you that have died. That is the word here. That, that there are times in life where you, have, you experience a sense of loss, and as a result of that loss, you are grieved. Now folks, what I want us to understand here is that the greatest problem with our choosing not to put off, and our, choose, our choosing to, yeah, to refuse to put off, and our choosing to refuse to put on, is that we grieve God's Spirit. <clears throat> it demonstrates here very clearly that you and I have the ability to change the emotional disposition of God by how we behave. I mean, think of it. God doesn't change in His character. He doesn't change in, how, in, 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 in a lot of different areas, but folks... His feelings will change. The Spirit of God will change based upon how you and I live. Well, why would the Holy Spirit be so grieved by just one person who is choosing not to live a life that pleases the Lord? Why would, why would the Spirit of God be grieved by just one? Well, I want you to see this here because there's a great significance here that I want you to see. This concept of the Holy Spirit was first mentioned in Ephesians chapter 1. Particularly, it says in that passage as well that He was our sealer. It says in chapter 1, verse 11, in whom also we have ob ob obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the, the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of, the, of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom, also ye, uh, in whom ye also, after that, ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also ye, ye after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. 
which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. We saw back in that passage that the Spirit of God was integral in our salvation. And what He does for us is that He, the Bible says, there is the interest of our inheritance. That God has laid up for us a vast and grand inheritance and that in, in, the interest of that, or the, I'm sorry, the earnest of our inheritance, not interest, the earnest of our inheritance, the earnest of that we have now in, in the work of the Spirit of God in our lives and His indwelling and His sealing. And the emphasis that we have in that passage as well as this passage is that the Spirit of God is permanent and it implies here ownership. That God has given us His inheritance because He owns us. Why is it that God is so, the Spirit of God is so grieved? Well, we are owned by Him. But I want you to notice, secondly, this reality. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 21, would you turn there with me? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 21, we have here another, another uh, uh, function and role of the Spirit of God in this, in this, in this book. It says in verse two, verse, chapter 2, verse 21, "...in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through His Spirit." God says that His church is the habitation of God. The Spirit of God and dwells in a particular way the body. Now you say, I'm not sure I see the connection here. Well, I want to suggest to you folks that the reason that the Spirit of God is so grieved by our bad behavior is because of how it affects the body. Now follow this. Paul has said that your refusing to put off and your choosing to put on will negatively affect the body in multiple ways. And if you choose to put on instead, it will positively affect the body. And then he says, look, realize that your ultimate reason is don't grieve God's spirit. Because when the body is hurt, God is grieved. You say, I'm not sure I agree with that. Would you think to me, just think, you don't even have to turn there, think of Acts chapter 5 and the sin of Ananias and Sapphira. Do you remember that passage? Do you remember, do you realize that we see tangibly in that passage three out of the four of these sins in that passage? Just think through this for a minute with me. The first sin in this passage is you need to put away lying and speak truth with your neighbor. Did Ananias and Sapphira, did they, did they do that? Yeah, they violated that. They lied. Next one. We don't know about that one because that's internal rather than external. I don't know if I can find in the passage where they, their anger turned, they were angry, and then they, they sinned as a result of their anger. I don't know if we can find that in the passage, but it wouldn't surprise me if there was bitterness there. Bitterness is such a root of sin in everybody's life that it wouldn't surprise me. I don't know that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't identify that specifically. But it wouldn't surprise me if I got to heaven and asked the Lord. Not that I'm not sure it will matter that much then. But, but um, if I asked the Lord and say, hey, were they, was there bitterness there too? Would that fit in there? Um, I don't know. But not for sure. Let's go to the next one. Well, did they steal? Yeah, folks, when you lie and say you're going to give one thing and you withhold, you're stealing. So they stole. And was there corrupt communication? There sure was. And as a result, Ananias, both, and Ananias and Sapphira both at separate times come to Peter. And when they do, he strike, they, God strikes them down. Because why? They lied against who? Not the church. They lied against the Spirit of God. The, the, the reality is there, the Spirit of God is mentioned. Why? Because they, they did damage to the body and it caused great grief on the part of the Spirit of God. And that's why it's so important for us. Folks, it is, a, it is incredibly important for us if we are going to glorify God 
and be involved in this body life that God wants us to be involved in and have significant furtherance for the kingdom of God, we have got to choose to put off the old man and put on the new man. It's not a matter of whether God will be faithful to you if you don't. It's not even a matter of, of whether or not he'll love you. It's not a matter of those things. It's a matter of the fact that you're damaging his body if you don't. And I, and I am too. Just in conclusion, number one, we must remember that ungodly behavior will result in harm to the body of Christ. We must remember that godly behavior will result in help for the body of Christ. And let me just say this. This message has had a bit of a negative tone to it. That is because I do see that in the text, that the real emphasis here in the text is that we, we've got to be very careful about grieving the Spirit of God. So I think the text in this case is, it's not negative intrinsically, but it is, it is sort of a warning to us that what we do in our behavior matters. But I want to be positive for a minute. Can I do that? Everybody goes, yeah, please. When we are, when we do have good communication, when we are truthful, when we are laboring and we are giving to one another, when we are doing these things, folks, when we are angry but we are keeping in check and we're not letting it go down, go on, uh, not letting the sun go down upon our wrath, when we're doing those things, we get, we get to make significant God contributions to the body of Christ. We get to help the body. And that pleases God. I mean, just think about it. You get to please God. You get to change God's disposition by giving Him pleasure. Now, that's not in the passage, but I will say it's in the next verse. We're going to look at this more. But just by way of, just look at this for a minute. You get down to uh, the next chapter, and what you're going to find is that verse 2, and walk in love, that's, that's going to be more positive. Walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given, us, given himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God for what? A sweet-smelling savor to God. That you and I, when we put on and walk in love, which we'll look at in more detail, it is as though a fragrance to God that's greatly pleasing to Him. And that, that ought to be our greatest motivation. Because He has done so much for us, we really want to please Him. But if we choose not to, and we choose to please ourselves to the exclusion of pleasing Him, not that they're all, that's always mutually exclusive, but if it is, we will break, bring grief to the Spirit of God. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we do come to You and all of these areas are common areas for us to be very cavalier in. Particularly the last one of having corrupt communication. We would admit before you that we often don't, don't really consider whether what we are saying is really building up or is it potentially tearing down. I pray, Lord, that you would help us in this area, in all of these areas, that for the cause of Christ and the furtherance of God's kingdom and your pleasure, we, you would, we would put on a new man. And we would be very careful in these areas. And that we would 
you would knit us together as a body and demonstrate to us and for us and through us just exactly what you want for your church in this local assembly and that we might really be able to to make significant contributions to the um, to the universal church and ultimately to the furtherance of your kingdom and we pray these things in Christ's name amen